a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Jörgler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have the 7th of November 2017 and I've come to the mic to read to you another portion, number 9, of the wonderful book Martin Luther wrote and published in 1545 against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. This reading will bear the title what are God, Christ, Church, World and Lawyers compared to the Pope? That's one of the sentences that we will meet during the reading. And um, I almost try to take a sentence out of the reading and make that the title of the video. Work fine in the old German, it's going to work fine in English too, I guess. What are God, Christ, Church, World and Lawyers compared to the Pope? Now, before I begin new reading, I go back uh, to the second paragraph on page 312, and we're going to start with repeating what we ended with last reading, because last reading was quite intense, and what I am going to read now is building up on what I read last time. So that we can get the best understanding, I will just go two paragraphs back to the middle of page 312 and start reading there. But I will, of course, uh, withhold my comments a little bit because I made them in the last reading. So for everybody, everybody who reads along in his own copy of the book, which is still Luther's Works, Volume 41, Church and Ministry, Part 3. I start on page 312, in the middle of the page, on the second paragraph. This is why the Pope here lowers his guard, and builds on the rotten foundation that because St. Peter alone replied, he was the Lord over the other apostles, and the Pope over all the world. There it is clearly in the text that Christ does not ask St. Peter, quote, who do you say that I am? Unquote. But he asks all the disciples, saying, Who do you say that I am? And St. Peter had to reply for all of them, and his reply had, at the same time, to be the reply of all, as just it happens in worldly and domestic spheres, when a servant, town clerk or secretary is the spokesman for the council, the community or domestic staff, but is not thereby the lord of the city. Or a lawyer or chancellor may speak the words of the emperor, king or prince, but is long way from being emperor, king or prince himself, just as the Pope from these words of St. Peter wants to be lord over apostles and the churches of all the apostles. That is rotten, I say, and the Pope will not last long if he does not bring up something better, as he will do now, as follows. Quote, and Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Unquote. This is Matthew chapter 16, verses 70 through 20, as written in the book. As I said to you, I do not read from the King James Bible. If not necessary, I will just take the quotes as they are written in the book. Now, 
we are continue with the new part of the reading and then you see of course because it's all uh, hanging together hmm? now if you have eyes Martin Luther says don't stick them in a bag and this is a German proverb in German that sounds wer nu hi die Augen hat der stecke sie nicht in Beutel huh? Wer nu hi Augen hat der stecke sie nicht in Beutel so if you have eyes don't put them in a the bag or don't stick them in the bag that's a literal translation of the German proverb and of course that means that if you have eyes use them to see huh? if you have ears to hear hear if you have eyes to see see and if you have a mouth to speak 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 up and protest the Antichrist anyway now if you have eyes don't stick them in the bag and if you have ears don't send them across the fields so that you can see and hear how the Pope is there made Lord over heaven and earth, over church and over emperor. Christendom did not know of this important article of faith from the beginning until the papacy. Even the top lawyers, as said above, Johannes Teutonicus and Panormitanus, those desperate heretics deny this and refuse to concede anything in the text to the Pope. But what are God, Christ, Church, world and lawyers compared to the Pope? Quote, Simon Barjona says the Lord, you are blessed. Unquote. Good for you, O Simon that you know that I am the Messiah and the Son of the Living God. Your father John did not teach you this, for this is what Jesus calls him. In the last chapter of John, so John Ultimo 21 verse 17, quote, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Which Matthew 16 says in Hebrew, Simon bar Johanna, or even shorter, Bar Jonah, which means son of Jonas or son of Johanna. No, you did not get this deep understanding from your biological father, nor did the other disciples, including you, get it from flesh and blood, or from their fathers, or from several people, rather. My Father in Heaven has revealed it to you. In these few words of Peter, which he confesses with all the other disciples, for they are all represented in Peter's reply, is included the whole of the Gospel, indeed, all of Holy Scripture. What else does Scripture from beginning to end intend to say, except that the Messiah, the Son of God, should come? And through his sacrifice, like that of a lamb without blemish, as we read in First Peter chapter 1, verse 19, bear and take away the sin of the world, and thus deliver from eternal death to eternal salvation. Holy Scripture, Genesis 3, verse 15, her seed shall bruise your head. And Eve, in Genesis 4, verse 1, as she speaks of Cain, Quote, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord, unquote. in their meaning these words sound exactly like Peter's, for she wants to say, now I have the seed of the right man, the Messiah, the Jehovah, that is, God and Son of God, who is to do what was promised to us. But she mistakes the person, otherwise her words at this place are very similar to the words of St. Peter. See, a great thing like this is in St. Peter's words, that is, a true apostolic speech. This is what all the apostles, not only St. Peter, afterward preached in the whole world, and preach until the end of the world, for as was heard, not St. Peter alone, but the other through his mouth answered this question the Lord had put to them. The Lord has asked this question to all the disciples. They were all gathered together 
Jesus and his twelve disciples. And Jesus asked all of them, but not all could answer, so Peter was the mouth, the speaking mouth of all the twelve. And Jesus did not address St. Peter alone, but the others also, and through his mouth answered St. Peter this question the Lord had put to all of them. This is what we have to understand, and where, of course, the Pope gives you a different explanation. He thinks that Jesus gathered with all his twelve disciples and just picked Peter and asked him alone. No, 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 no. That's not how it happened. And the Bible reports that. The Lord then says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on the, this rock will I build my church. In St. John 1 verse 42, he calls him Cephas. You shall be called Cephas, Kef in Hebrew, Kepha in Chaldean, and Petros or Petra in Greek, Rupus in Latin, all of which means rock, in German like <coughs> in Germ uh, all of this uh, all of which mean rock in German, like the high rocks the castles are built on. Now the Lord wants to say, you are Peter, that is a man of rock. For you have recognized the name and named the right man, who is the true rock, as scripture names him, Christ. On this rock, that is, on me, Christ, I will build all of my Christendom, just as you and the other disciples are built on it through my Father in heaven, who revealed it to you. In plain German, one would say, quote, You say, on behalf of all, that I am the Messiah or Christ, the Son of the living God. Very well then, I say to you, you are a Christian, and I shall build my church on a Christian. Unquote. For in German, the word Christ means both the Lord himself, as one sings, Christ, the Lord is risen, Christ ascended to heaven. And he who believes in the Lord Christ, as one says, you are a Christ. Thus, Luke in Acts 11 verse 26 says that the disciples in Antioch were first called Christians, which is why names have survived such as Christians, Christendom, Christian faith, etc. So here our Lord gives Simon, son of Jonah, the name Man of Rock or Christian, because he, from the Father, recognized the Rock or Christ and praised him with his mouth on behalf of all the apostles. From this it is clear enough that by the building of this of his church on the rock or on himself, Christ meant nothing else but, as was said above from the apostle Peter and Paul, the common Christian faith that whoever believes in Christ is built on this rock and will attain salvation, even against all the gates of hell. Whoever does not believe in Christ is not built on this rock and must be damned with all the gates of hell. Now, the point is that we are to believe in Jesus Christ. We are not to believe in Peter, right? So, just think about it. If the Pope was right in his, in his explanation that the church is built on Peter, then we are to pray and give honor and obedience and worship Peter, not Christ. Right? Because we are to worship the builder of the church, the cornerstone of the church, but that's Christ, not Peter, and not Peter's quote-unquote successor, which of course the Pope is even not, even though he claims to. He is not. 
But that's what the Pope does here. When he says that he is the successor of Peter and on Peter the church is built, then we must worship him. But biblically, that is absolutely not, how do you say that? Um, this is not confirmed by the Bible. It is only a papal explanation of what is written in the Bible. But the Bible explains itself. itself. I don't need a Pope to explain it to me. Because when I let the Pope explain the Bible, then of course he is God on earth. He is not. So let's read this last sentence again. I think it is very important that we understand this correctly. From this is it, cl uh, it is clear enough that by the building of his church on the rock or on himself, Jesus Christ meant nothing else but, as was said above from the Apostle Peter and Paul, the common Christian faith that whoever believes in Christ, not who believes in Peter, because on Christ the, build, the church is built and not on Peter, whoever believes in Christ is built on this rock. The rock is Christ, not Peter, and will attain salvation, even against the gates of hell. But whoever does not believe in Christ is not built on this rock and must be damned with all the gates of hell. This is the simple, the single, certain understanding of these words, and there can be no other. This the words clearly and convincingly prove, and they agree with the words in the last chapter of Mark, Mark Ultimo 16.16, 16, quote, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, unquote. And also with John 11.26, quote, Whoever believes in me shall never die. Unquote. Yes, I say, remember well and mark diligently that the Lord in Matthew 16 does not speak of laws, he does not speak of ten commandments or the work we should do or, not, or could do, but of the Christian faith or the work of the Father which he with the Son and the Holy Spirit performs in us, namely, that he spiritually builds us on the rock, his Son, and teaches us to believe in Christ, that we might become his house and dwelling, and is proven in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 7, and Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. Now I'm just going to open here my King James Bible and then we're going to read 1 Peter 2, 4 through 7. 1 Peter 2, 4 verses... Uh, 1 Peter 2, sorry, what am I doing here? 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 7. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual, spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And when we turn to Ephesians chapter 2, let me just see, Ephesians chapter 2, and then verses 19 through 22, there we read, and this is of course now, as the one before from the King James taken, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, quote, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building 
fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Unquote. You see, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, and we are all the bricks. And with that, we are building a temple, and Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the rock, not the Pope. Martin Luther continues further, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. The Lord wants to provide well for his churches, build on him and believing in him, because they should preach and confess the gospel before the whole world and govern on the basis that Christ Jesus is the Son of God. He wants to have their words honored and not scorned, as though he were speaking personally from heaven. Now he who hears the gospel from the apostles or churches, and does not want to believe, should be sentenced to be damned. Again, if he should fall after he has believed, and will not convert back to faith, he should be sentenced in the same way. He should keep his sins and be damned. On the other hand, he who hears and believes the gospel, or turns from his sins back to faith, should have his sins forgiven and should attain salvation. And he will consider such a verdict in heaven as if he had spoken it himself. See, these are the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and they should be used to give eternal retention and remission of sins in the church, not just at the time of baptism, or once in a lifetime, but continuously until the end. Retention for the unrepentant and unbelievers, remission for the repentant and believers. And here remember once again, and write it upon your heart, that the Lord does not speak here of laws, or of the works we should do, but of his works, namely of retention and remission of sins. To retain or forgive sins is the work of the divine majesty alone. Do you hear what Martin Luther says here? To retain or forgive sins is the work of the divine majesty alone, not of man. So why are you going into a church and do an oral confession in the confession box? Why do you think that your priest can forgive sins? Why are you even telling a carnal, fleshly, sinful man your sins. This is the reason for the intelligence network the Roman Catholic Church built during the Dark Ages. Right? So you say, well, they lost that today. No, they didn't. But the state works for the church and therefore all the state agencies like NSA and CIA and all the other intelligence agencies are doing the work that the confession box did a few hundred years ago for to get control over the people like the priest had before. But Martin Luther says here to retain or forgive sins is the work of the divine majesty alone. Look, only someone who is holy can forgive sins. This is why when, when lately I watched this, uh, over, over last again, I watched this video from Kenneth Copeland again, where he stands there with Tony Palmer, and they have this message from the Pope. You know the video, I guess. Um, then to, then uh, Kenneth Copeland, in the end, uh, gives a message back to the Pope and says with his whole congregation, Be blessed. Be blessed. So he... And his whole congregation bless the Pope. How can he bless someone? You can say, God bless you, and that is your intention, your wish, that God may bless you. That is correct. But I cannot say, I bless you. Because then I am blaspheming. Because I put myself in a holy position. And I am not. 
I'm a sinful man. I'm a wretch. I'm wicked. Yeah? To retain or forgive sins is the work of the divine majesty alone, not of any man. That must be clear, that must be understood. But, Martin Luther continues, he wants to perform and accomplish these works of his, through his church. That is why he says that whatever it will bind or loose on earth should be bound or loosed by him in heaven. That is why, too, the two items follow one another in the children's creed. Quote, I believe in one holy Christian church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins. So, where the church is, namely, the building on the rock, there are the keys to the forgiveness of sins. Second, note that the keys and the power to bind and loose sin was not given, or the keys were not given, to the apostles and saints for their sovereignty over the church, but solely for the good and use of sinners. For one does not need the keys and their office where there is no sin. One should neither lose nor absolve St. Paul and saints like him from sins, for they have none except except the daily and usual ones of the flesh, which remain until death, as he says in 1 Corinthians 3. Um, and then it says 4.4, 4, so I don't understand that. It's whether 1 Corinthians 3 or it's 1 Corinthians 4. Quote, I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. Unquote. Now let me just check if that is now. 1 Corinthians 4.4 4 or 3. I think there we have a uh, 1 Corinthians 4. There we have a wrong for this. For I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judges me is Lord. That is um, 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So 1 Corinthians 3. Come on. 3 verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another I am of Apollos, are ye not are ye not carnal? So I don't know. This is uh, I am not aware of anything against myself. I should look that up and see where that expression comes from in the Bible. Yeah, I'm sorry, that was a, a wrong um writing in the Bible when it says 1 Corinthians 3 verse 4 4 so that actually speaks of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 um, in the book it is written I am not aware of anything against myself but I am not thereby acquitted so that is even shorted because in the King James we read for I know nothing of myself yet am I not hereby justified but he that judgeth me is the Lord and now it makes sense so, instead of 1 Corinthians 3, something it should have said 1 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Anyway, let's read the sentence again that we uh, get into it. One should neither lose nor absolve St. Paul and saints like him from sins, for they have none except the daily and usual ones of the flesh which remain until death. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 4, for I know nothing by myself, yet Am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Unquote. And in Romans 7 verse 25, quote, I serve the law of sin with my flesh. Unquote. Instead, one should let them be commanded to the rock on which they are built. But they are necessary to the sinners who are not built on the rock or who have fallen off so that one can build on, the, on them again. Thus, it is not a worldly power with which the bishops wish to boast and rule over the churches. It's grace, not power. Beneficium non dominium, <laughs> as it says in Latin. It is grace, not 
power, beneficium non dominium, but is a spiritual power given for the good and salvation of sinners, so that they might seek and find these things through the bishops and churches as often as they need them, whereby the sinners should be saved, and not bishops, lords and masters. Just as when a prince entrusts a thousand golden to his servant to share among several poor people, these thousand golden should not make the servant rich or lord over the poor, but rather, as the Lord commanded, the golden should be sought and found, freely and with no strings attached by the poor people. He should show himself only a willing servant, for the consolation and benefit of the poor people. Remember this well, it applies to the Pope. Third, mark well and remember that the keys were not given to St. Peter alone, much less to the Pope alone after St. Peter. Although the Lord was speaking only to Peter, Peter nevertheless stood not only for his own person, but in the place and person of all the twelve disciples with whom Christ had started to talk and question, as all the teachers before the Pope was instituted by the Emperor Phocas have understood, taught and believed in all of Christendom, and still believe today in the Orient. Oh, what is the need of many words? Light cannot be darkness! In Matthew 18, verse 18, Christ is not speaking just to Peter, but to all the disciples. Quote, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Unquote. These are the same words about binding and loosing that he used above with St. Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, and even though there is no mention of the keys, it is nevertheless the office of the keys, as was expressed in Matthew 16 so forcefully above. Now we find a little footnote here where it says the second edition of this treatise of, uh, against the Roman papacy and institution by the devil. Um, it inserts here... Yes, this is the text in which the promised keys, just as the lawyers wish, are indeed given. I tell you does not mean I shall give you, but I tell you and give you now. This is in the second edition of this book. And he is furthermore clearly speaking here of sin, which one should bind and loose, for shortly before that he speaks of the sinners who do not wish to hear, and says, quote, Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, in Matthew 18, verse 17. And immediately afterward, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, etc. And what is more, he says in the same place, quote, if two of you agree about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Unquote. Matthew chapter 18 verses 19 through 20. Very, 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 very important part. If two of you agree about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This is what I call true fellowship. This is what I call true ecclesia. True meeting of Bible believing, Jesus Christ following people. You don't need mega churches. This is the real church. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And the sentence before is also very important that it says, if two of you agree about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. 
And another place in the Bible it says we can do nothing of ourselves, but we can do anything with, uh, in Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what this is speaking about. Because for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Always two or three, eh? Well, it starts already in the Law and the Prophets, or the so-called Old Testament. And it says two or three witnesses, right? Where two or three are gathered in my name, in the midst of them, there am I, Jesus Christ said. That is true church, true fellowship that you can have. Now we bear that even two or three assembled in Christ's name have the same power as St. Peter and all the apostles. For the Lord himself is there, as he says in John 14, verse 23, If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Unquote. This is how it has happened that a person who believed in Christ has often resisted a whole crowd, like Paphonitis, uh, Paph Paphnutius in the Council of Nicaea. And as the prophets resisted the kings, priests, and all the people of Israel. In short, God will not be bound by numbers, greatness, importance, power, or whatever is personal in people, but rather wants to be only with those who love and keep his word, even if they should be mere stable boys. What does he care about high, great, powerful lords? He alone is the highest, greatest, and mightiest. And there, of course, is another um, expression in the Bible that says that God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. And this is what this actually uh, is about, right? God is no respecter of persons. So let's go if this site opens up here. Yeah, but that's not the one that I wanted. So it's... Um, where is that to be found? Let me have a look here. In Acts 10.34 we find that in the King James Bible, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Sometimes you can just take one verse out of the Bible and say with that anything that Martin Luther already said here. He goes back to uh, Paphnutius in the Council of Nicaea, and as the prophets resisted the kings, the priests, and all the people of Israel, in short, God will not be bound by numbers, so it doesn't matter how many people say otherwise. He will not be bound by greatness or importance, power or whatever is personal in people, but rather wants to be only with those who love and keep his word, even if they should be mere stable boys. What does he care about high, great, powerful lords? He alone is the highest, greatest and mightiest, and that is why that God is no respecter of persons, as we can read in Acts 10.34. Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Because they are all the same. They are all born in trespasses and sins. They are all wicked. And even if they are not, they are all brothers and sisters, as the New Testament teaches us. There is no hierarchy in between. Okay, you can have an academic title or whatever, but that doesn't make you better than me. That only makes you here and there a little bit more studied in this or in that field, and that's all. That's it. But therefore you are no better person, you are no higher person, you have no more power or whatever than I have. Except, of course, I give that to you. So God says, what should God take care about high, grateful, powerful lords? He alone is the highest, greatest and mightiest. 
God doesn't need to respect anyone because no one stands on his level. He is solely above all because he is omnipotent. He is almighty, long-suffering, loving, merciful, forgivenessful. He is perfect, the only perfect one. Therefore, he is the highest, the greatest and mightiest, and he, of course, does not care about, about high, great or powerful lords. He is Lord of lords and King of kings. Now, if the Pope could still stand stiffly and proudly, which he cannot, on the passage on Matthew, uh, Matthew 16, then we, on the other hand, stand even more proudly and stiffly on Matthew chapter 18. It is not another Christ who speaks in Matthew 16 with St. Peter, and then in Matthew 18 with the other disciples, saying the same words and giving power to bind and to lose sin. So let the Pope go ahead with his St. Peter, binding and losing what he can. We shall consider the power of the other apostles to bind and loosen to be the same as St. Peter's, even if a thousand St. Peter's were one Peter, and the whole world were a Pope, in addition an angel from heaven were on his side. For we have here the Lord himself over all angels and over all creatures who says they shall all have the same power, keys and office. Even two simple Christians assembled only in his name. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them and if two of you agree about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Sound familiar? For we have, we have here the Lord himself over all angels and over all creatures who says they shall all have the same power, keys and office. Even two or three Simple Christians assembled only in his name. The Pope and all the devils shall not make a fool, liar and drunkard out of this Lord for us. Instead, we shall kick the Pope with our feet and say he is a desperate liar, he is a blasphemer and idolatrous devil who, in the name of St. Peter, has snatched the keys for himself though Christ has given them to everyone in common, and who wants to make the Lord in Matthew 16 a liar, indeed, this one should praise. Again, in John 20, verses 21 through 23, the Lord, says, uh, the Lord speaks not only to St. Peter, but to all the apostles or disciples. Quote, As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Unquote. And when he had said this, he breathed upon them, not only on St. Peter, and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now let's go to the King James Version. <clears throat> I just want to make sure that we read in the true word of God, because I don't know the translation that they took here. This book is from 1966, remember? So we are speaking here about John chapter 20. So that's the last but one chapter, verses 21 through 23. It says in the King James, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be upon you, uh, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed, he breathed on them, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosesoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosesoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Unquote. This is the true 1611 King James Bible version of John, chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. As the Father has sent me, even so I 
sent you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, not only on St. Peter, he breathed on all of them, and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Unquote from the book. I would really like to hear what the ass Pope could say against this. If he had a thousand villainous tongues, they would all still have to break down here. For the words of the Lord are clear. Quote, As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. You! You! Not thee alone, Peter. That is what I have preached at the Father's command and have built upon myself the rock. You should preach and build on just this and nothing else. And you shall all have the same power and keys to forgive and to retain sins. These are just the same words about binding and losing that he said in Matthew chapter 16 to St. Peter about keys. This is the Lord himself who says these things. That is why we don't care what the ass-pope raves in his decretals. And here, so that we help the poor lawyers, John Teutonicus and Panomeritanus, too, is... Uh, too, is the text in which the promised keys, Matthew 16, as they think, are indeed given to St. Peter, and he is restricted in his possession of them in order to make it clear that the promised keys of, keys of Matthew 16 were not promised to St. Peter alone, for the fulfillment of this promise is not given to St. Peter alone, but is given to all disciples. I say this as a favor to the poor lawyers. We theologians have stronger reasons and do not dispute about the future and present word. Uh, de verbo futuro e presenti, a reference of the exegesis of Matthew 16 and 18 by the canonists. In such high matters, we theologians have stronger reasons and do not dispute about the future and present world in such high matters. That is why the words that our Lord says to all of them, quote, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Unquote. Mean just as much as though he addressed each one separately. See here, Peter, receive the Holy Spirit, if you forgive the sins of any, etc. See here, Andrew, receive the Holy Spirit, if you forgive the sins of any, etc. See here, James, see here, John, see here, Thomas, see here, Bartholomew, see here, Philip, see here, Simon, see here, Judas, etc., etc. It is just as much, I say, when the Address, when he addresses them collectively as if he had addressed each one individually. And this is the same with Matthew chapter 16. Make sure that you understand that well. That is why he there speaks to Peter, but he could have also said, See here, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, Bartholomew, Philip, Simon, Judas, my Father in Heaven revealed that to you. He could have said that to everyone individually, but he spoke to just Peter, who was the mouth of all the apostles. It is just as much, I say, when he addresses them collectively as if he had addressed each one individually. Each one had to accept it at the same time as the others, because it was said to all at the same time. That is why St. Peter cannot be understood to have the common keys and the common office of the keys, which is the forgiveness and retention of sin for himself alone or peculiar to himself over the other apostles. And there is no exclusiveness here, as the Roman asses patch and invent. Jesus Christ never ever took one of the disciples and put him above all the others. He did not take Peter and put them above the others. He did not take anyone else. 
he did not take Peter, he did not take James, John, Thomas, Bartholomew, Philip, Simon, Judas, whatever the names were. Jesus Christ handled them, treated them all as the same. They are brothers in Christ and he is the head. He never made Peter the head. But the Pope explains it in that way that he was made head. Which he is not. He never was made head. That is why St. Peter cannot be understood to have the common keys and the common office of the keys, which is the forgiveness and retention of sin for himself alone or peculiar to himself over the other apostles. There is no exclusiveness here, as the Roman ass patch and invents. It does not say, to you alone, Peter, and even at the vessel, the excluded would still not be the apostles, but perhaps Caiaphas and the Mosaic priesthood. In any case, Peter stands for all the apostles, as these two passages, Matthew 18 and John 20, prove forcefully and mightily. That is certain, Martin Luther asserts to us. That is certain, and I agree Absolutely. The wrong teaching only comes from the Antichrist, who teaches that a word speaking to Peter, who represents all the apostles, is only spoken to Peter, which is not true. So the problem is, of course, that when you have no Bible, and you just have the words of the Pope, then of course you are easily misled. That's why it is so important for you always to have a Bible. Then you can compare what the church hierarchy, because you will not hear the Pope teach anything from the Bible, but a priest, a pastor, a bishop, a cardinal, whatever, whenever he speaks of something in the Bible, Take your Bible with you and then you see that what he teaches is according to the word or is not according to the word. And because their teaching is not according to the word and people do not have their Bible with them, they fall for the lies. People are just not read in the Bible anymore. They are not studying the Bible anymore, study all other things and getting themselves entertained. You know, entertainment is just the devil's way to replace joy. And joy we get from the word of God. Reading it, studying it, loving it, learning from it, being edified by it. We need the word of God. We need the Bible to hold it against everything that is taught in this world and to check whether it is true. When you have the truth in your hand, nobody can deceive you. So put on the full armor of God. Take out the two-edged sword, the word of God, and check everything against it. And you will so see through the papish, popish, and every other Catholic and every other deception in this world. In any case, Peter stands for all the apostles as these two passages prove forcefully and mightfully and mightily. That is certain, absolutely certain. Just take them and then see what the Pope claims and then see what the Bible says. Compare these two and then you can say you did research for your own. And the only thing that you found out during your own research is the thing that you can really believe. I can talk here until the cows come home. If you don't research it for yourself, you will never believe it. Because don't take me as a preacher. Don't take me as a teacher. I am a wretched sinner just like you. I try to open your eyes to the truth. That's why I say, take your Bible in your hand 
next to what I'm telling you here, next to what Martin Luther is telling you in his wonderful book against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil, and check and check and check that everything that I say here, that everything that Martin Luther says in his book, is according to the true word of God. And if not, call it out. And if so, then repeat it and go out into the world and preach it and teach it and tell the people that the papacy is the Antichrist. There is no other Antichrist to look for. You know, in the past, I did a lot of broadcasts with Tom Fress. And Tom Fress always hammers the same point. The biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. There is no future one and there is no preterist one. I mean, who believes in the preterist anyway? today. But today everybody believes in the future Antichrist. Now let me tell you one thing. In the time of Martin Luther and all the time before, there was no other teaching but the biblical teaching. So what we call today the historicist view, or what uh, Tom Fress and other people call the historicist view, is the biblical view. It's actually the only view the biblical, the historicist view is the only view that you can have. All the others, futurist and preterist, are later inventions. When you look back into the fulfilled prophecies of the Old Testament, when you look back on them, do you do that with the futurist glass on? Do you do that with the preterist glass on? Or do you do that with the biblical glass on? Huh? Futurism is a lie conceived by the devil to take away the attention of the papacy. And even though that internally in the Roman Catholic Church it always was known for the people who studied the words that the papacy was the Antichrist, only with the publication of the word of God in the language of the common man of John Doe in the beginning of the 16th century, the danger was there that all of a sudden not only the people or a few people within the Roman Catholic Church, but everyone, even the plowboy on the field, could see, could learn, could understand that the papacy is the Antichrist. The biblical view, because the Bible opened the eyes of the people. And then, of course, the papacy had to take measures to deceive people, to take them away from the truth. And therefore, the Roman Catholic Church, with the help of the new founded Jesuit order, invented the futurist and the preterist view. And all of a sudden you had three different ways that you could look at Bible prophecy. You could look through the futurist glasses, you could look through the preterist glasses, or you could look through the biblical glasses. So when you dismissed the futurist and the preterist view and held on to the Bible, well, the only thing that was left for the Jesuits to do was to forge your Bible, to corrupt your Bible. And that is why we have so many different Bibles out there. You know, when Kenneth Copeland and John Palmer said, uh, 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 Tony Palmer said, uh, there are 33,000 whatever denominations out there, and that division is diabolical. There are maybe 33,000 different Protestant denominations out there, but how many Bibles are out there also? What about that division? Only one word can be true, and to me that is the King James. I'm not going to go into any discussion on that. I'm going to read to you in the future a wonderful book by David W. Daniels, Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible? And latest, at the latest point, then you can make up your own mind. Don't forget that I am also uh, still continuing the series when I have any time. 
<laughs> an hour of the truth and reading an understandable history of the Bible by Samuel Seagib. I don't go into a discussion of King Jay onlyism. Okay, that's something everybody has to understand for himself. That there is only one true word, and when there is one true word, how can there be 250 or 300 different versions of it? It can't, because the word that God speaks, He only speaks once, and that is the truth. Thy word is truth, the Bible says. Uh, at least my King James Bible says that. I don't know what your Bible says. So the point is, take off your futurist glasses, pick up the Bible, put on the full armor of God, take the two-edged sword, that is his word, read it, study it, get edified by it, Study it with the help of the Holy Spirit and you will understand that only the view from out the Bible can tell you who the biblical, prophetic and uh, historic, historical Antichrist is. There is no other possibility. You have to see it through the Bible. You have to explain it through the Bible. I cannot hammer enough on that point. You don't need books from... James Aitken Wiley, Henry Gretton Guinness, and so many other authors about the subject, even though they wrote many good books, that's not the point. But you don't even need their writings. But the good thing in James Aitken Wiley and Henry Gretton Guinness is, in all their writings, they always point to the Bible, and they say, here it says, here it says so, here it says so. That's what you need to do. Pick up the Bible and get studied in the Bible. Get edified by it. Get your wisdom from the Word of God itself. Through the Holy Spirit. The biblical view is the only view. All the other views are invented lies. There is no futurist way to explain the Antichrist. There is only a futurist lie to deceive you to an Antichrist that is already long here. The biblical view is the only view God wrote. Whom you gonna believe? Francisco Ribera? Louis de Alcazar? Cardinal Bellarmine? Schofield, Westcott and Hort, Tischendorf, or God? That's a question you have to ask yourself. And when you come to the conclusion that only God speaks the truth, then you will much more enjoy my next tenth reading of the wonderful book from Martin Luther, Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil, where Martin Luther explains biblically and only from the Bible standpoint that the office of the papacy is the Antichrist of this world. Thank you for watching, listening and commenting and until next time, Jobless 66 from Mawa of the Truth says God bless you, signing off and Bye-bye. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape a false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape